wasting so much. Oh, by the way, uh, yeah, and just happy Women's Day. Since today is the last day um, of Women's Month, we thought it to, to be more opportune to have this um, meeting uh, being held uh, today in this very important uh, Women's Month. And then we have lined up an excellent um, lineup of speakers who will lead us in, in, in basically the discussions this session. My job is just to hold um, the space and do more uh, listening and interaction with all of, all, of the, all of you guys today. So I think since we have lost a little bit of time, maybe I should introduce our two, um, our two speakers uh, then so that we don't have to go back into that session again. And to do that, we have lined up, like I said, uh, two speakers. I will uh, the, the program will run in such a way that, and I think you have received the program in your in the invitation. We'll have initial remarks by Miss Olga Mapanje, who is our research fellow and a PhD scholar at the University of um, of, of of Pretoria. Olga Mapanje is doing her uh, her PhD in rural development, as I said at the University of Pretoria and partially uh, supervised or mentored by me. And she has interests in sustainable agriculture, food systems, and climate change adaptation in the agricultural, agricultural sector. But her PhD is focusing on the role of public policies and intermediary institutions, uh, how they play that in, in accelerating uh, access to climate finance and adaptation in Southern Africa. For those who have been attending our webinars, you would uh, be familiar with the work that Olga is doing. Our last webinar was in May and she led the discussions around um, gender, gender lens investing. So this is part of this conversation that we are continuing. So, so Olga will set the theme. She will um, define the research questions that we're trying to respond to. And really the aim of this webinar is we want to hear from you based on your experiences, your nations, and also to help guide our research so that we are sure that the kind of questions that we are responding to are the identified gaps based on your experiences to help us that discourse. And we'll go, we're going to be having a series of these workshops so that when we publish our paper, it's really a paper that is driven a needs-driven paper and is informed by your experiences on the ground. And so once Olga has provided uh, uh, this uh, part with my long-term long -term friend and with a wealth of experience on, on, on gender, I will ask if there's anyone here to speak news. Um, I think it's one of our... Uh, our, our, um, our my, one of my colleagues who had uh, unmuted. But um, Lisa will respond to, um, uh, to what Olga has provided and not only that, but share her experience with having worked in this sector for more than um, uh, you know, 25 years. I've, I think I've known Lisa for more than 10 years, probably if I'm not mistaken, Lisa. Um, but if I'm just to officially read Lisa's background, Lisa is the managing director and founder of founder and practice manager of Saedi Consulting, which is based in Barbados and the Caribbean. Uh, she has more than 25 years experience in international development, working for more than 20 years on environmental management issues. She has provided technical expertise at national, regional, and international levels, including research to inform policy and decision-making processes from a social and gender perspective. She is a lead author of the IPCC for the first gender and, uh, and environment outlook, as well as the green environment outlook uh, report, uh, report six. She has served as, as deputy country representative for UN Women in Mozambique. I think that's when I met you, Lisa, when you were head of, deputy head of UN Women in, in, in Mozambique many years ago. And her role there, included contributing to strategic planning, program development, and project oversight, including taking lead on the office's post-disaster drought response in, 19, in 2016. She's currently involved in a few Caribbean projects on a just energy transition, as well as in Africa, including on-grid and off-grid opportunities 
and solutions. So ladies and gentlemen, we are in very good company today. And I'm really hoping that um, this discourse will um, really inform how we look at this issue around gender and how you and I can all work towards ensuring that women and youth and all the, those who are most vulnerable as a result of climate change will benefit from the transition so that no one is left behind. So without much ado, I would like to kick start the program by giving the opportunity to uh, Ms. Olga Mapanje to, uh, to provide her insights and then, and then we can take it from there. Over to you, Olga. Thank you, Dr. Mao, and uh, welcome to our participants. I'm just trying to share my screen now. Uh, is it appearing? Yes, it's appearing, Olga. All right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. So this is my presentation. Uh, it's on the gender dynamics of the just energy transition in South Africa. And uh, as Dr. Mao has said, I'm a research fellow at the African Center for a Green Economy. And we are conducting this uh, webinar as part of the methodology to this study. So this is the layout of my presentation. I will start by looking at um, the background of the issue, and then I'll give a normative framework. And then after that, look at the current challenges as far as this issue is concerned. And then I'll to, uh, elaborate on the challenges. I'll also give a case study of the rape program in South Africa. And then after that, manifestations of gender inequality here in South Africa. And then a, I will also give a, uh, an illustration of the gender just transitions outcomes framework. And then I'll, I'll leave you with the discussion points. Okay. So uh, in terms of background, uh, as we all know, we are in a climate crisis today, and this crisis is a result of the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, uh, which are uh, necessary for industrialization of economies, like here in South Africa. And one main solution to this crisis is reduction in carbon emissions or um, moving from fossil-based uh, energy systems to those energy systems that are cleaner or to renewable energy systems. And uh, the just transition process now is uh, complex and it holds a, a lot of risks and uncertainties for many people. And for, for example, here in South Africa, we have the case of uh, livelihoods in Pumalanga province, where a lot of them kind of depend on the fossil fuel value chain for their livelihoods. And uh, apart from this, it is also argued from literature that the just uh, transition can hold a lot of opportunities that can help us in addressing some of the inequalities and poverty problems that uh, the old or the past economic model has. So in terms of the normative, normative framework of the study, these are some of the... Uh, uh, policies and programs that are in place here in South Africa. So at the national level, South Africa has implemented a number of policies to try and uh, 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 put uh, frameworks in, in place for the move to renewable energy or to, to move to a low carbon economy. For example, we have the rate program, we also have the carbon tax. We have also the National Climate Change Response White Paper. And in addition to this, South Africa has also ratified a number of international and regional commit commitments to gender equality. For example, we have the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We also have uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, where SDG 5 is focusing on gender equality. And we also have the SADC Gender and Development de uh, de Declaration, among others. And uh, despite having all these uh, policies and programs in place, uh, we find that uh, they do uh, prioritize reduction of carbon emissions at the expense of social justice issues like gender equality here in South Africa. For example, studies have shown that uh, from the rape program, women benefited only from 10% of the jobs that were created. 
and another study by Taylor 2023 indi uh, indicated that among other things, uh, I, I mean, she found that among other things, uh, the energy transition will not promote gender equality in South Africa. And I will give the reasons uh, as I look at the case right now. So for example, uh, she highlighted that gender, uh, in terms of gendered labor, only 24% of the people who are working in the solar plants in South Africa were women uh, for the study that she did. And in terms of uh, uh, labor at the solar plants, in, uh, in terms of the terms of labor at the solar plants, the, many of the jobs uh, were reported to be short term and many of the respondents also complained that uh, they were underpaid and they had safety issues at the workplace. And also they complained about lack of capacity building so much that they would feel they are not more employable even after the contracts ended. And uh, at household level, uh, she reported that bulk of the care work done in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the place of study was done by women and girls, and the burden was exacerbated, especially when resources required for household, household, household work, such as electricity and water, were unavailable. So now from this study, we managed to come up with some of the manifestations of gender inequality in South Africa. And we have seen that uh, uh, gender inequality manifests as a result of economic, uh, human, or social political factors. For example, under economic uh, factors, women lack access to capital or finance uh, for them to be involved or engaged in uh, green uh, enterprises. And secondly, they also lack access to energy. And then under the human factor, Women also lack access to education and information. So I'll elaborate more on these factors in the next slide. And then lastly, on the social uh, political factor, women also lack access to employment, particularly in the energy sector. They also lack access to leadership opportunities. And also they are not well represented maybe at uh, the national level in policies and programs in the energy sector. So just to elaborate more on that, for example, in case one, where women are lacking access uh, to economic opportunities, such as access to finance, they, we find we, we found in our previous study that um, there are a lot of barriers associated uh, with uh, financing uh, green enterprises uh, among women. And this is where now the importance of gender lens investment comes to play. Uh, secondly, uh, women also lack access to energy, and as a result, there is energy poverty here in South Africa, and the current rate of energy poverty here in South Africa is slightly above 50%. So energy poverty manifests through uh, uh, one, use of unclean energy uh, sources. Secondly, it manifests through lack of access to electricity, and it also manifests through inability to afford electricity here in South Africa. And women are found to be victims of energy poverty because of the care work that they do. Secondly, uh, the other manifestation is uh, limited access to information or education. And we have seen that there are a limited number of graduates in STEM fields here in South Africa. For example, fields like maths, physics, or engineering at tertiary level. And these are fields that are necessary to, to propel uh, the just transition process. So um, there is really a limited representation of women in uh, the jobs that are going to be created in the, in, the, in the STEM fields. And also women entrepreneurs, according to a study by UNIDO, uh, they are unaware of uh, local opportunities uh, that the green transition can offer. So these can be opportunities for funding or this can be training or mentorship opportunities. Lastly, uh, we found that manifestations of gender inequality also are a result of poor and marginalization of uh, women in the energy sector. And as I have 
already indicated, uh, they they are less represented represented in the energy sector. For example, here in South Africa, about 31% uh, of the employees at ESCOM are women. And another study said that about 21% of the employees in mining companies are women. So also, there are also fears that 80% of jobs that are going to be created in the renewable energy sector will, I mean, 80% of jobs that are going to be created in the transition to low carbon economies are going to be in sectors that are dominated by men, for example, the energy sector. So in our study now, we also uh, in, uh, engaged the gender just transitions outcomes framework to try and uh, look at uh, where the gaps are existing as far as policy and um, programming is concerned here in South Africa. So this is uh, a framework that was developed by the Global Green Growth Institute in 2022, and it illustrates four steps that are necessary to make sure that uh, outcomes are gender just in transitions. So the first step of this framework is characterization of the gender just, I mean, of the just transition or the green energy process. So in characterization, what we will be doing is we are looking at the ambition and purpose of gender in the just transition uh, process. We'll also look at maybe the sectoral level or focus of a policy or program, and then uh, the resourcing to say, where is the funding uh, for this particular program going to come from. And then the second step of the framework, it entails gender equality ambition level. So we know now that um, there are basically three levels of gender equality ambition. And the first one is the gender sensitive. The second one is the gender responsive. And then the last one is gender transformative. So we can evaluate policies or programs and their ambition level using this step. And then on step three, it entails uh, the selection of outcome domains. And this is done through uh, engaging women agencies or engaging women themselves in the process. So uh, for example, they, it can be done through engagement of uh, women agencies like the UN Women here in South Africa. And lastly, we have step four, which focus, uh, which is a focus areas for understanding ch changes in gender equality. So this now entails um, uh, application of feminist theories as a way to understand gender equality, for example, in the energy sector. So having said that, uh, uh, the questions and discussion points for this webinar are as follows. The first question is how does the just energy transition impact men and women differently here in South Africa? And then will the just energy transition in South Africa promote gender equality? And if so, what opportunities are there to make sure that it promotes gender equality? Uh, the, third, uh, the fourth question is, which factors might exacerbate existing gender inequalities in South Africa? And then lastly, how effective are current policies and strategies in addressing uh, existing gender imbalances in achieving a just transition in South Africa? Thank you so much. I've come to the end of my presentation. Now back to you, Dr. Mao. Thanks, Olga, for a very elaborate uh, um, overview of the gender dynamics in the, in the transition. A really, really insightful, um, you know, uh, insight that you have developed. And obviously, for me, the key issue is that, you know, doesn't matter how we look at it, uh, women and girls are always getting the raw deal. And, and so in many respects, it's not surprising that, you know, in South Africa, for example, we find that only 10% of um, women have benefited from the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Program. And, and so the question is, how do we move forward? How do we do things um, differently? But like I said in the onset, this is not my conversation. This is everybody's um, uh, conversation here. I would like to... Um, invite, I think, let's do it this way. Let me invite Lisa to respond 
um, to this, and then we can open up the floor for further uh, for general you know, queries, comments, and, and and so on. But I would I would beg us to take uh, Lisa's um, first take and her own insights in on and work having worked in many many years on these issues, and then we can uh, default to the discussions in um in, in general. So Lisa, I would like you to just you know you first react uh, you know uh, have your personal reflections on and mm -hmm. on this issue around, around um the mainstreaming of um of gender and how far we are. Lisa, if I remember, you know the first time we actually co-hosted a training with you at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Cape Town in 2014. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, and so at that time was, you know, the um, the social dimension of green growth, you know. It's yeah. been more than, um, it's just under 10 years now, how your mm -hmm. experience has changed and having moved away from the Southern Africa region mm -hmm. to the Caribbean, um, mm -hmm. what insights do you bring to us in this discourse? Great. Well, thank you very much, Mao. Good to see you. Uh, you know, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am really happy to be here. Uh, but Mao is reminding me that you know we started off when we were very, very young. Uh, clearly, um, ten years in, uh, some things have changed and some things are still battling. Um, so I want to first thank Olga for her presentation. I think it was very robust and really kind of brought out some of the key issues that we're still grappling with. So in terms of personal perfect, uh, reflections, I do have a bit of a PowerPoint presentation because I think I will help um, particularly afterwards as I go through some things and also for the audience. I think we've made some significant progress, certainly the conversation around needing to include gender and addressing social dimensions is no longer strange or an odd thing in terms of when we're looking at issues of energy and a just transition. I think the just transition itself as an idea um, that talks about equality and access of opportunities, making sure that the costs and risks of transition are not um, loaded on any one group, particularly those who are less able to bear those kinds of burdens. Um, that's become more normal uh, in the conversation. Um, you definitely see now more consistently that energy projects have to do um, gender assessments, have to have a gender action plan, particularly for a lot of the international financing that's available there. Um, we can also see um, that, um, you know, environmental and social impact assessments are becoming de rigueur, if you could say that normal for, particularly from the infrastructure side, particularly from a lot of banking institutions. Um, but yet we recognize that if we do these uh, processes, assuming that everybody's the same, uh, that the needs and demands and issues and even the constraints are the same, that we tend to overlook uh, a lot of less obvious factors. We tend to overlook a lot of nuance that exists in the lives of people when it comes to access and control over energy. Um, and so it is still important for us to really um, do this work and do it well. The question ourselves also about our assumptions, our biases, uh, we all have, it's a very natural thing socially. And so, you know, the, um, ambition level that Olga would have mentioned is an important element and the way that we started to look at that is to make sure that you know if you're an operating in a program or project framework that you have what we would call a gender marker that allows you to ask questions about what is it that you're going to be intending to do how are you intending to do it and therefore if you look at all these things in combination what is the level of change that you're seeking to uh, you know to 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 make these kinds of internal questions working through et cetera, are very critical to really doing a better job of not only defining uh, gender and just transition, but also in terms of being able to um, make it happen and to understand. So I'll just stop there very quickly in case you have any follow-up questions, Mo, and then I'll talk a little bit more about our experience in the region and some of the issues that we're experiencing that are very similar to some of the challenges that Olga would have raised, and also some of the findings that we see in other work that I would have done in Mozambique and some work that we've just started in Somalia. Thanks, Lisa. And I just realized you, you had slides. I was not aware that uh, uh, you, were, you were going to share them, but I'm glad they're here. I think that what I would like to do, uh, mm -hmm. in, instead of hogging the mic, is to, mm -hmm. is to open up the 
the conversation a little bit for people on the platform here to share if there's any uh, you know follow up questions they want both to you and to um to 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 Olga if there's any new perspectives they would like to share before we come back to you to share your specific uh, learnings from the Caribbean. And I will just talk about the Caribbean. I would like to acknowledge that this has been such a diverse uh, group. I'm very excited to see people all the way from South Sudan, Kenya, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and from here. So very, really nice stand up. Thank you so much, everyone, for you know, gracing us this, this afternoon or morning, wherever you are. So I would like to open the floor for any, any you know, thoughts, perspectives, any questions that you have both for Olga and, um, and 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 Lisa, so we can take it from here. Remember, the main aim for us for hosting this webinar is that we are researchers and we have formulated these questions. We want to go out and gain insights. We also want to hear from you whether our research questions are robust, if there's any knowledge gaps that you are experiencing in your work that you feel you know the research needs to respond to. And we're here to serve that purpose. And so your perspectives will be very important um, for us moving forward. So I would like to open the floor once again for any queries before we go back to, to Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. I see Brian from UNEP has a yes, hand up. I see, raise up. I can't see who that hand is. Um, but please, uh, yes, Brian, Brian, Mubiwa, thank you. Hello. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, I was trying to unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mao. Uh, our, our relationship also dates back uh, many, many years. Uh, greetings from UNEP, uh, and, and we're glad that you, you, you've uh, coalesced us to have a conversation uh, around this very, very important topic uh, on just energy transition. But just a couple of points, if you allow me, um, and to an extent, maybe throw some spanners into, into the works a little bit around, uh, but I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that as researchers and academics, you can uh, accept uh, uh, inputs around how you can, you know, then reconfigure your research questions. So, so the, firstly, um, what we've learned from an environmental perspective is that there are multiple concurrent transitions that are taking place simultaneously. I know, of course, uh, we tend to lean heavily on the energy transition, uh, but I think it's prudent that we don't forget and leave behind other transitions that are taking place uh, parallel to the just energy transition. We talk of the transition to a green economy. We talk uh, of a transition to a secular economy. We talk of um, the transition to blue economy. We talk of a transition to formal economies, you know, from informal uh, to formal, uh, particularly when we talk, look at, uh, in, look at the, the waste uh, secularity sector. We have informal waste pickers and these drive to an extent to then formalize that. So, so the, all these are interlinked but distinct transitions that are taking place. And it's important that we, we, we analyze and assess the role and participation of women in all these transitions. And, and not only look at women's participation in the energy transition sector uh, part. That's point number one. And, and the second point I would make uh, by your leave uh, chair is, uh, it is important that we then try to leverage and, and align the just transition efforts uh, with gender equality you know, efforts and pursue both in tandem, pursue both at the same time um, so that we can arrive at a place where we, we can then say we, we uh, transition towards a, a gender just transition. And that's a term that uh, maybe we need. I need to propose or proposition to the team that there is what we could refer to as a gender just transition, not just not simply transition, just transition. The third point to make is 
uh, we know that women can meaningfully participate and by meaningful participate, uh, we're talking about contributing to as well as benefiting from. And the misconception that sometimes we, we get engulfed in is that women should only benefit from, yeah, whereas the, and as, as the speakers, uh, the two speakers indicated, uh, they, they have you know, very high scope to contribute you know, meaningfully to this transition in many ways. Uh, so, so I think we need to tap into, into that uh, capability. But what are the barriers and what are the enablers? I think that, that's where the issue is. Barriers you know, to, to their meaningful participation. And how can we make it easy for women to uh, then participate meaningfully? And, and, and I'll just highlight three or four very quickly uh, before you, 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 you mute me, Chair. <laughs> Uh, first is uh, the knowledge and understanding, uh, because uh, there are key women formations or women groupings that might not be at the same level as we are in terms of understanding what just transition is. So we believe efforts should be made to enlighten to conscientize around this just transition, which uh, is a buzzword, uh, perhaps in a language that they can understand, and then they can assist in infusing their own interpretation and understanding of what just transition is to them and it should be to them. The second point is um, um, catalytic liquid pots should be availed you know, to women. Uh, so that they can then get into entrepreneurship enterprises. Then access to land <clears throat> and resources is also very important. And the third point, um, the fourth point rather is, the, perhaps we could consider where, where there is need and, and we are all, most of us are academics here in, in, in different rights. Curriculum review and curriculum integration where we then now bring the interlinkages between you know, gender equality, gender uh, mainstreaming, gender justice, and, and, and cross hybridize you know, those mm -hmm. elements with just transition efforts. You know, but, but you need to that, do that at the curriculum level so that you know, those things are taught at school, um, at, at, at very low levels of school, but most importantly, at college and tertiary level. Uh, those will be my few humble submissions and and uh, chair greetings from Dr. Mesret uh, from Pretoria. <laughs> no, <laughs> th 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 thanks, Brian. It's really good to have you here, and yeah, looking forward to engaging more. We've done amazing work together in the past for for UNEP, so it, it's good coming by. And this this part of this conversation, like I said, you know, we started doing work with Lisa since 2014, and and you know, so it's this kind of collective effort because the problems that we were were challenged with. Are, a wicked problems and wicked problems, you know, require collaboration and um, and, and cooperation. But Brian, before I ask uh, uh, um, um, Olga and Lisa to respond to your plethora of um, questions and reflections, I think that you raised very very valid questions. And I'll just take one or two of the issues you've raised, and particularly the idea around transition. You know, I completely um, agree with you that the transition is beyond um, just an energy transition. It's an economy-wide transition. And we make that argument in most of the work that we do. Just last yesterday, we published some work which is coming out next week in the South Africa Sustainability Handbook and around green jobs and the fact that this transition is an economy-wide endeavor. And if you look at the challenges that South Africa experiences, particularly around making sure the inclusion is, I mean, the transition is inclusive, we need to be able to create jobs. And the renewable energy sector alone cannot create all the jobs to take over all those that will be lost in the other sectors. So I'm completely with you that the transition, and I think that perhaps we use the word interchangeably when we talk about energy transition, it's really an economy-wide um, transition and those sectors that you outline are important because mm -hmm. as an example, you know, 70% of jobs in Africa are in the agricultural sector. And so climate smart agricultural practices are going to be very critical for building resilience in terms of um, 
job creation, food security, and, 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 and so on. And the other point that you, I think that I'll just, before I let them go in, is uh, the issue around um, uh, women participating beyond just the benefits and the idea of unlocking, a, let's say, climate finance to support female entrepreneurs to be much more productive within the economy is absolutely vital. And I think that Olga mentioned in her statistics how much uh, investments are actually going to women-owned um, enterprises as opposed to your traditional um, uh, enterprises. So, they, so the, the challenge is, is, is cast out, and, and, and uh, the question is, how do we um, uh, kickstart the process of the transition to make it a gender-inclusive transition like you have, have stated, and we're providing some of those insights to unlock the barriers. But I want to um, give um, uh, Olga and uh, Lisa an opportunity to respond to you, while at the same time, if there's any other person who has any questions, please raise up your hand, share with us your perspectives. I'm always ready to go, Mo, but I'm not sure if Olga wanted to say anything. Yeah, please, please go, Lisa. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I think there's a lot to unpack from what Brian would have noted. Um, I, I think there are two, you know, two or three normative things I'd say before I go into some of the practical issues. I think it's important, yes, it's important to think of a gender just transition, um, but I think the just transition element is important because gender itself is part of a lens. Social inclusion is one element of it. Um, and I think it's also going to be important to make sure that we understand that transitions, even though they mean well, um, generally are not always good for everyone. And I think we sometimes uh, romanticize the transition and we romanticize sustainable development, but it has cost to everyone, particularly those who are poor and more vulnerable. And part of what usually is missing is the fact that we've not considered those costs. We've not considered the cost of the transition and the displacement that happens economically and socially, and we put no money towards those things. And so that's why you end up also with losses whereby you may gain energy jobs, but you've lost them in another sector because there's been no discussion, there's been no coherence. Uh, there doesn't necessarily automatically have to be a loss of jobs because if you think about what you just said about agriculture, right now, when you look at a whole bunch of other issues, there is very little that you can do if you look long term that will not require energy of some sort. So why would you not want to make sure that your energy transition also is enabling of a more effective and more sustainable agriculture, for example? There's the food, water, and energy nexus that's an even bigger combination of issues that you have to think about. And right now, as we look long term for our water provision, our water distribution, our availability to have clean water, again, energy is going to be an important component of that. And so I think critically, it's important to really just think also about a number of key nexus issues that need to happen in sync and at the same time in order for us to get some of the th those greater benefits to get that contribution and participation that we're talk talking about. My second quick point is the fact that Yes, energy poverty is a key issue, but time poverty is an even bigger issue for women. And if we want to involve women and have allow them to, you know, enable them to contribute and to benefit, we need to enable them to have the time to do so. Again, we underestimate the burdens that women are going through in terms of their gender-based responsibilities, including care work, and the fact that, yes, we may have lots of things out there, but if they don't have the time and space to, able, to be able to read, to be able to understand and appreciate that this is an opportunity, then we're still going to be going against the grain and not necessarily doing what we need to do. And so if you look at the fact that, you know, you're looking at a diversion and a, you know, a doubling up of care for women when it comes to unpaid care and domestic work for women in South Africa, for example, that is going to be a huge issue in terms of their ability to be engaged, whether it's in the curriculum level, it's going to be the, the, the household level, it's going to be at the labor market or work level. So these are just a couple of things that I want to bring through because when we're talking about bars and constraints, those are the ones that are going to be driving a lot of what we're, we're seeing. And if we don't tackle the gender issues at the household, community, and work-based level at the same time and in sync and also where they're different, we may continue to find ourselves doing some, uh, making some advances, but not making enough of the kind of quality advances that we need to make. Thank you, Lisa. Really important perspectives you introduced around the issue of nexus that, you know, this you kind of just look at these uh, issues in isolation. They, they're so interlinked and understanding those interlinkages is probably where the sweet spot lies in identifying those solutions that work. 
Olga, do you want to respond to some of the questions that um, Brian has raised, or should we open the floor for more questions and insights and queries? Oh, oh, thank you, Dr. Mao. I think I just have two points from what uh, Brian said. And the first one is I acknowledge that indeed uh, we are in a period where we are having a multiple transitions. Uh, for example, me coming from the agricultural background, I know there's an agrarian transition in agriculture, so there's need now for farmers to drop the unsustainable practices for climate smart agriculture or other sustainable agricultural practices. And then uh, the, indeed they are interlinked and it is very important uh, to look at them as a war and to see the role of women in them. And then the second point that I wanted to highlight is uh, I think from what Brian has said, one key point that stood out is that we, there is need to align just transition efforts with uh, gender efforts, especially here in South Africa, because from our study already, we are seeing that um, at the current state, uh, the just transition efforts in South Africa uh, are not necessarily promoting gender equality because there is a disconnect between the efforts, uh, the just transition efforts and the gender efforts in the country. Thank you. Th 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 thanks, Olga. Uh, is there any questions um, uh, from the audience? Any perspectives? Please raise up your raise your hand and uh, make your make your input before we go back to Lisa to give a specific experience from the Caribbean region. I would like to hear from you, and I'm going to pick people if I don't hear, uh, because I just I can't resist asking them. Um, um, but uh, from gender CC to share with us, it's after all gender CC. <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Mao. I'll actually just in now. I like the way that Lisa raised the fact that the just transition is romanticized, and there are multiple transitions that are going to take place here. But to our two speakers. I just want to ask a very genuine question. This buzzword of the transition, although we are buying into it, we are bringing communities in, can we have real faith that actually we can end up with a just, a wholesome just transition and not an unjust transition? It's just like, to think of the ideal at the end of the day. What are your thoughts on that? I want you to think just about that because I'm seeing a lot of those vulnerable communities actually being really left out and leaving us with an unjust transition, whether be it in the land sector, in the water sector, especially when we look at the wealth nexus. Thank you. I mean, before, uh, you, very, you raised a very important question, um, but, but a few years ago, I think, not a few actually, in November, we did a field work around um, the Komati uh, power station. For those who, who are not aware, the Komati power station is one of the most recently decommissioned coal power plants mm -hmm. um, in Kulanga. In and mm -hmm. talking to local communities, members, local traders, and so on. The level of anxiety there was mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. I can never forget this young lady who shares, who basically sells um, corn by the roadside. That's and right. she, she was very worried that mm -hmm. the traffic of the coal transporters is going to dwindle. What is she going, how is she going to make her livelihood? So, mm -hmm. so anxiety, the transition risks mm -hmm. are very real. And, and, mm -hmm. and so we we have no option but to say what does the transition actually mean for the man on the ground and for mm -hmm. us at the center we really believe that for the transition to be meaningful we have to create opportunities and those opportunities are those that can provide people with decent work that mm -hmm. they can make their life they can be able to sustain their livelihoods out of it. so i hear you and sometimes it frustrates me when we move from one bus to another, you know, at the moment it's the tra just transition. A few years ago, it was green economy. Before maybe mm -hmm. the transition, we're talking about circular economy, green growth, all of these things. But for us at the center, we believe that buzzwords are just exactly that buzzwords. We need to strip these buzzwords 
in a way that makes sense to our people on the ground. And I think that speaks to the issue that uh, Brian raised around how do we unlock some of these barriers and present these challenges in a way that our community is understanding. Because believe you me not, that the communities recognize that the climate change is happening. They're already seeing the different, uh, the, the, the changes in the patterns of rainfall, increased extreme floods and so on. And many of them are already taking measures to adapt to these changing climates. But the issue is how do we integrate this local knowledge, these local experiences in designing the policies that inform how the transition happens. So I believe that there's a lot of talk and what we really need to do is to get our hands dirty, go out there and make the difference that is required on the ground. And the kind of work that you're doing at Gender CC speaks exactly to that. Anyway. Thank you, Marshall, for jumping in now. Um, I, I, think, I think you've hit the nail on the head. And I think the first part of this is understanding that we are not necessarily the experts on the issues. Um, we have some knowledge um, and we may understand some of the broader dynamics of the economy, but in terms of where things will settle on the ground um, and some of the, you know, it, it's really, you know, I thought you got give a perfect example and this is the example we often try to talk about in our um, infrastructure projects or agenda projects. It's fine to think about jobs, um, but jobs can be a very limiting kind of lens um, because they don't always capture opportunities and services that people provide to those who are working. And so the example of this lady who's on the street selling corn based on a traffic-based mechanism and market is exactly the kind of thing we need to think about because that is the broader issue of how a transition envelops or does not envelop everyone and provides benefits that are obvious and not so obvious. Um, and so I think it's important to really also get from the local community their understandings of how this will roll out. What will this mean? Again, because when we think of transitions and we think about uh, moving out of coal into something else, don't get me wrong, I'm all for that. But the lesson that we learned in the Caribbean is that when you are decommissioning a sector and then saying you want to transition people into a new sector, you have to really understand a lot of very critical issues, including how seasonality of the work and income may apply, what this means for how people manage their money and how they're able to invest their money and how they're able to pay their bills. So a quick example, we did, you know, the, the, the sugar industry was decommissioned in one of the countries in the Caribbean and the obvious solution that was identified was to transition people to the tourism sector. That was done without considering that every ecosystem has its own mechanism and the fact that you know, uh, the, the, the sugar industry had ups and downs and those ups and downs and the seasonality of that did not actually match with the tourism sector. And so when people are expected to work 120% in the service sector was actually when people were working 20% or less in the sugar sector. When you think about transitioning people, particularly given their age dynamic, so there was a, 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 a differential, even including women, of people who were 50 and above, and then there were some who were 20 something and below. When you think of those transitions, you think about jobs, you think about what people did during those job periods, what they were finding is that people were not always turning up to work on time. People were not always understanding the differences. I say this because if you're going to do a transition and you're going to move people, you want people to shift. You need to understand how that those economic drivers and that economic ecosystem shape a lot of things, including culture, social norms, economic spending habits, decision making, because if you ignore those things, that is where you're going to end up with an unjust transition. And that will bring us back to the point that Bertha raised about Will we have a transition and how just will it be? Who will it be just for? And who perhaps will be left on the sidelines of it? And so it's really important to get some of those local dynamics and those household dynamics right clear in terms of really planning and therefore thinking about how you're going to mitigate some of these risks. Um, and I think what we're seeing more and more is the need not only just for safeguards that are just environmental, but also social, but also the social environmental ones, but also making sure that we're really clear about the risks and the displacement that happens and that we really account for and budget for that when we're talking about the transition. If we're only budgeting for the good stuff, but we're not budgeting for the bad things that are likely to happen um, and that can happen in very acute ways, we're going to end up costing just as much or even more to the persons we're trying to help. And so I'll stop there for now. 
Uh, th th thanks, Lisa. Really appreciate. Is there any other perspective <laughs> from any person in the audience? And I'm, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to pick um, on people <laughs> as, as I see uh, fit. You know, one of the key things we at the center, we convene, um, uh, and we've done it for years, since 2014 as well, uh, a business incubation program. At, at first, it used to be called a New Economy Accelerator. Now, we, we, it's called the Green Innovation Hub, where we are supporting uh, uh, up to about 15, I think 20 entrepreneurs from five African uh, countries. And a large number of those entrepreneurs uh, are, are women. And inevitably, the conversation always comes to how do we unlock um, uh, unlock uh, finance for 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 to for to accelerate the transition, but also to support these entre entrepreneurs. And obviously, that's a very challenging um, uh, task because a lot the sector, the transition, even the opportunities within the energy, not just generally the transition are very emergent. So the business models are in most cases not well tested and so on. So unlocking investments in the traditional sense is very difficult for these entrepreneurs. So a lot of the opportunities rely in kind of financing mechanisms that are less risk averse. And that is, means grants and working very close with um, uh, development uh, partners. So I would like to, you know, I know there is um, a Valentin Benoit, who is um, the investment officer for uh, AFD based in Johannesburg, to just give us from a development partner perspective, how you're thinking about some of these issues in terms of channeling investments into the sector, but also more looking at the gender lens um, investing. I, I'm sorry to, you know, to pick you out, but we would really love to hear from a development partner's perspective, what is it that you're actually doing in the region and how you're thinking about this? Because I know that um, having engaged with the office in Johannesburg, uh, the AFD and the French government is doing quite a lot in uh, supporting South Africa's um, uh, uh, just energy transition ambitions. Valentina, are you there? Are you willing to share what the AFD is doing? Maybe he's trying to... I think, I, I think he's unmuted, but um, he's we're not hearing, maybe. Yeah, I think so too. Um, would really love to hear their perspective, but is there any other person who would like to share their experience? Lisa, is that what... Yes, no, sorry, we can't hear you. You need to unmute. I think. I think you need to unmute. He seems unmuted from my side, but <clears throat> still not hearing. But we, yeah. We, yeah, we, we can't hear him. No, we can't. We can't. Maybe Valentin can write in the chat. Yeah, we, we, we can't. We can't hear you. But as, as we wait for ah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, okay. Thank you, okay. Sam. I will once again for picking on you, but I think your perspective is very important. Sorry, sorry for that. And you all thank you, thank you, Doctor, for, for your question. Uh well I try to respond uh, as best as I, uh, as I can from the development partner perspective, as you were saying. I, I think well there, there are different levels of, of support that we can provide of course as a as a dfi i think that uh, of course we need to acknowledge the the work that is being performed on the on the ground by by intermediary uh, organizations such as the uh, the province the municipalities and the and the and the civil society organizations so so i think it's it's something that we we need to we need to support um, because they are the best uh, position to 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 understand what are the local needs and uh, and make sure that the financing is is channeled uh, through uh, the, the the right uh, the right organization and enrich the enrich the, the the results. 
Um, and on another level, and what we are trying to do here in, in South Africa is also to engage um, at more at national uh, level, uh, at, at policy level, I, I would say. Uh, as, as you may know, as part of the of the of the one billion commitment that France did uh, to support the just energy transition, we did a, um, a policy-based loan uh, that. Uh, goes to uh, national treasury and, 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 and with disbursement that are triggered upon the, the achievement of, of, of specific policy actions. Um, and we see that there is still a lot that needs to be done on the just side of the just energy transition. Uh, and, uh, and what we are trying to do now is to have further engagement with national treasury, but also with all the relevant uh, departments and uh, organs, from, for, for instance, from the presidency, to see and co-identify with them what could be uh, relevant or, or lacking policies that can uh, support uh, the uh, mainstreaming of, of gender in uh, energy transition decisions. And, um, and this is a, a work that, that we are starting uh, now and that, that we are trying to kick off with our, with our partners and uh, and with the with the government in in South Africa, and and we we hope that we we will identify some of this policy action that we can that we can support for, with our tools here in, uh, in in South Africa. I hope that responds to to your to your question. Yeah, th thanks, Valentin. I think yeah, that's a very important perspective, specifically the focus on um, of, uh, different levels of of, of government. Our experience working in, in the Northern Cape, for example, is that a lot of this discourse around the just transition it has already been alluded to is happening at a very high level. But the local munis municipalities is really where a lot of the gaps exist and where a lot of emphasis is required to drive this inclusive uh, transition. However, you know, as you probably all know, South Africa and the local municipalities is their need for capacity at that at, at, at that level. So, so pitching the transition also at that level is extremely important. I think that the role of institutions like SALGA, which is South African Local Government Association, becomes really critical in terms of designing policies and strategies that would allow um, municipalities to respond to the uh, to to the challenge. But I also think that there is a really good opportunity in um, because obviously all the local authorities have, don't have the same you know capacity. You know, you find a city of Cape Town, for example, is probably much more empowered than a rural uh, um, municipality elsewhere. How do ca can these local authorities work, collaborate with, with, with each other to ensure that they can coherently uh, implement their um, policies? So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, Lisa, do you want to, do you have any other perspective? Because I remember you saying you're going to come back to share the specific Caribbean um, experience. Oh, sure. have you already? Um, I, I can touch a little bit on that on the policy side, but I see that Valentin has his hand up again. Yes, sorry. I, I don't know if, if you can hear me again because um, I have yes, some we can. issues. Okay, cool. Uh, no, actually, it was more a um, question that I had on, on my side because. Well, mm -hmm. as a as a DFI, we don't want to be prescriptive in any way, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and we are actually here to listen to, uh, to 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 you and to to understand what is at stake currently, and 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 I think that would be very helpful to to get also uh, your perspective as uh, people uh, as South African and as a gender experts on what are the if, if you have uh, some uh, insights on what uh, would be, to your opinion, the, uh, the, the lacking regulations or the lacking policies when it comes to uh, inclusion of, of uh, gender uh, in, the, in the just energy transition. I think that that would be very helpful to, to fuel that conversation. Thank you so much. A very good question, Valentin. I will uh, obviously open the flow to everyone, anyone who has any experience with Olga and, and, and uh, Lisa, um, probably mm -hmm. more leaning towards Lisa because of your experience in the region. And anyone in the audience, if you know you would like to share insights, please, you're most welcome. 
Well, let me like let me make a pause to see if anyone wants to jump in before I go in. Um, but Valentine's question and the questions you're raising makes a good segue to where I wanted to touch on a few things in my presentation on policies and plans. I think it's fine, Lisa, for you to jump in. Okay. And then I, okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we haven't looked at every policy out there, and I haven't necessarily looked at South Africa's in detail. I remember looking at some provincial plans uh, in the past in South Africa, and what I would say is that. Policies tend to be very neutral, um, very general. And if we really are going to support a just transition, they need to be more specific. Um, they, you know, and that could be that you still have the general chapeau, but there needs to be some very specific things. And what would what would a just gender gender just transition for taking Brian's language look like? You need to define it and you need to, to identify the criteria. What we've found in our analysis, and I think this is general across a number of policies that often you do not have very specific commitments to gender or you have a very general uh, commitment to gender. We haven't broken down what that means. Uh, and sometimes the default is that it's about women's participation, which is true, but it's beyond that. Um, it also needs to include uh, children. It needs to include the elderly. It needs to include persons with disabilities. It needs to include indigenous people. Um, and they all have very different needs um, in terms of uh, you know, how they use energy and the demand for energy. One of the things that we are, are thinking about, particularly now that you talk about climate change and you look at how temperatures are increasing, um, it's cooler in South Africa now, but summer is going to be hot, I would imagine, as it is everywhere. There is an increasing demand for cooling uh, technologies. Uh, you know, this year, if you look across the world, this is a big issue. If you look at issues of age, for example, this is a big thing for elderly people. It's a big thing for children, but it's also a big thing for women who are transitioning into menopause, for example. These are practical realities that we know of, but these are things we ignore. And this is where the demand is going to be coming from. And, and so it's getting to that level of understanding. Well, what is going to be driving the need and the use and the uptake of energy in the next 10 to 15 years? And how do we account for that? And how do you make sure that it's, it's affordable? Another issue is, and if I think about South Africa, safety in public spaces, safety in the street. If you look at who is in jobs that are working in jobs that you know that require them to transition to go home after nine, ten o'clock in the evening using public transport. Again, energy is going to be a huge issue there in terms of just things, basic things like street lighting. Um, and if you you know if you think about the GV rates in South Africa, these are going to be issues that you will have to think about as well. The dynamics between the rural and the urban are going to be different in some ways. But again, these are just very practical, basic issues um, where the demands are exist. They may not be um, articulated um, as easy as we would think, but this is the level at which we need to go to if we're thinking about really effective policies and plans. I would say you need to have guidelines that are specific about what gender would mean and how it will be accounted for. You would need to have um, standing operating procedures, particularly when it comes to contracting work. This is something that we've come across as we do work in the Caribbean. Um, and we actually provide very specific guidelines for how contractors are supposed to do their work, you know, look at labor, make sure that there's no forced labor, et cetera. There are all these things that will need to be part of the just transition um, in terms of decent work, in terms of a decent work enabling environment, environmental safety. So it, there's no um, easy path to energy, you know, to robust energy policy, but there is a lot that can be done and it doesn't all have to come from energy. A lot of it exists. Having a gender policy already in the country is already a good lifting off point for making sure that, um, that you know, the energy policy and guidelines and supporting structures and governance can do what they're supposed to do. I want to go back to the point that Brian raised about meaningful participation and Augur raised, this is really key. Um, this is not just about numbers. Numbers are important. But we need to know to, to, to go back to the data and understand who we're talking about, what we're talking about. But we need to make sure that we're looking at empowerment. We're looking at influence. That's key. Uh, often we bring people to meetings, but we expect them to nod and say, yes, wonderful. No, we need them to push back sometimes. And we need them to influence and drive the prioritization. Because that's going to be absolutely key as well. Finally, I'd like to say that one of the things that we've learned in our work is that we can't just use gender as a catch-all. We need to define what it means. Um, and we found that having a very specific gender framework allows us to do robust work and really get our clients, the governments, the DFIs, whoever, because we work for all of them, um, is to, and to really say, 
these are all the issues that are happening around energy. And if you want to have a plan, it means that you have to have things that you prioritize the short, medium, and long term. You need to understand the pieces and to determine which ones are going to be key. Uh, and they're both strategic and practical gender needs, but these are the main ones that we find that you need to operate in. And so access to energy is not enough. People need to be able to control it. You need to be able to use it for what they need. And that includes the farmer who is out in the field for 10 hours, does not need electricity necessarily in his house because he's not there and his wife might not be there. But what he does need is energy early in the morning and he needs energy in the field and he needs energy at night, particularly when his kids have to study after school. That's the kind of thing that we need to start thinking about. What also are some of the control drivers that are going to be important? Um, we've mentioned leadership and decision making. Um, what I would say is that often we default to the rights and participation because that's easy, but it's easy, but it's not enough. We need the governance mechanisms. We need assets. People need to also understand when they need energy for their assets to work, including accessing banking, for example. So if we think about um, where we are now, and again, I think of South Africa and the continent, where you're talking about e-banking, e-wallets, none of that can really happen without energy to support the cell phone and to support the banking mechanisms. That's a, an important one, whether you're employed, a business, et cetera. If you can't access the money and pay your bills and be able to buy supplies, et cetera, a lot of this stuff is going to fall apart. Um, access to information and education is really absolutely key. We need to make sure that we engage with people and understand they understand the issue. They may not use our fancy terms, but trust me, they're very clear on what the issues are and what the issues of justice are like. We need to kind of help them to be able to integrate that into the systems that we're working with, which is where the money is at. Um, but we also need, as Mal said, to be able to go back and really make sure we're also enabling that local knowledge, et cetera, because those systems need to continue to work. The more work we do, the more the system and the issues will change, the more we need to adapt. And we really need to kind of have a long-term um, viewpoint on this. And last but not least, a lot of this will circle around livelihoods. And we need to understand those livelihoods and what are the energy demands and needs. And I think when we start to really look at also the fact that sometimes you don't need to do all seven of these, sometimes four will allow you to be able to then get to some of the others. That kind of strategic thinking and analysis is key, but hard to do that if you don't have the data, which often we don't, because we don't collect data this way. And in the absence of that data, if I'm thinking about Mao and Olga and the work they have to do, is they're going to need to go out and collect data yourself. Um, and you can't do everything because it's research. You need to have a narrow focus to be able to come up with something useful. But you can do surveys and you can do stakeholder interviews to collect some of the information that will be critical for responding to some of the questions that you have on the table. Uh, and then thinking about how it will respond to how the just transition needs to respond to all of these seven some of these sevens and which ones are going to be critical for South Africa at this particular point. How will it add to what's already there um, rather than working alongside or perhaps sometimes in contradiction will also be an important element. And so I think of Valentin and Valentin and the work he's doing, I think helping with some of that coherence will be important, getting in and digging and putting in the money for some of the things that often will get funded, which is the gender guidelines, the gender analysis, uh, you know, the gender action plans, and the monitoring evaluation that needs to happen, maybe some really important opportunities going forward. And you've got Bertha and others here who are working in the trenches, who I think can also help to provide input and feedback on some of those. And I'll stop there. Wow, Lisa, thank you so much for that elaborate um, uh, uh, perspective in terms of how we understand um, you know, gender in the context of you know, energy transition. And I really like this frame so we'll be very keen to engage that with you around that to see how we can also inform our our method our methodology. You know, if I was to respond directly to also Valentin's perspective, when we started this work on gender, we did a like a high level scan um, in terms of who are the key stakeholders, what are the kind of you know policies that exist, and, and so and like Lisa, you said, you know, you in all the policy related documents you find these generic uh, mentions of you know it has to be inclusive it has to be gender responsive and so on but that is where it stops um and there's no depth to it there's no how do we actually achieve this and so there's a huge um, gap and for me that's what worries me a lot in terms of the discourse on the 
just energy transition that this issue around how do we address the just element is very critical but it's the one that is least uh, prioritized in terms of all the all, all, all the all the conversations that, need, that that need to happen so there's a huge gap there but even more importantly there's the lack of empirical data information on the ground to grapple with this issue and that's really what we're trying to study here that you know conversation is nice but we actually want to look at what does the data look like on the ground to be able to help us respond to you know these frameworks and to see whether this framework actually can work in the context of the region because obviously you know different regions have different perspectives and so on but ultimately we're hoping that this study can provide us with a framework that we can say, actually, this is what the transition, the gender element looks like in the just transition. How can you achieve the just element of the energy, energy transition? So thank you so much, Lisa, for that. Um, so I just want to, uh, we've got about nine minutes. I know we started a little bit late. I still want to go back to the audience before we make our concluding uh, remarks to see if you have any questions, uh, if you have any information you, are, you would like to share or any you know insights as far as this conversation is concerned I, I would really appreciate so the floor is open once more any text I assume that you know everyone is very happy and excited about all the information they have said. I know, like Lisa said, you know, these issues, no one is an expert. We're all learning, we're not we're all learning here. And it's just about this collective um uh, you know discourse that I think is very important to help us uh, frame our worldview and see how we can integrate these in the context of the work that we are we're doing. Um, Olga, I would like to come back to you and then I will also go back to Lisa just to make your concluding uh, uh, concluding remarks and, and then so that we can, uh, we can end the webinar. And, but if anyone still has any questions, the floor is open. So Olga. Thank you, Dr. Mao. Uh, I think this was a very valuable uh, webinar, and I managed to grasp a lot of things from the discussions that went on. And I want to thank uh, the participants for the valuable comments uh, that are going to lead us into more uh, developing our paper more. And uh, I think that's all from my end. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Olga. Um, Lisa, parting shots. I know you have not had breakfast. You it's probably still you know what is it eight a.m. in the Caribbean. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Lisa. Yeah, sorry. I was just saying. Hold on a minute. Let me do that. I was just saying that you know me so well that you know I haven't had breakfast yet. Um, but um. You know, but uh, no, I mean, I think this is also very useful and, and and helpful to kind of just hear and think through some of the issues. Um, I, you know, I'm looking forward to the continued dialogue. Um, I think that it's important to do so. And I think maybe one of the things that colleagues to think about is, well, if they had to choose, because they always have to choose a research, what would be some of the priorities um, that they think you would want to delve into for something like this for South Africa, given where South Africa is right now and where some of the plans are going to be? But I, I think that there's a lot of uh, valuable insight and knowledge um, in this group. Um, and maybe one of the, the ways that, you know, you can continue the engagement, Mao, is to think about <laughs> this group or part of it as either an advisory group or a reference group that could, you know, review and give you comments on the methodology and feedback, but then also help, you know, in the review and comments of the paper and also the dissemination of that work when it comes out because it seems very, very useful to some of the work that's ongoing already um, and some of the future work to come. But I'm just grateful to have had the opportunity to engage on the topic and to engage with all of you um, on this and happy to continue the conversation. 
th thanks, Lisa. Uh, really um, uh, useful to have you around and always good to see you. I hope that you know, we'll meet again when you come into the region or when we travel down that side. But also just to, in my own concluding remarks, to thank everyone for your really valuable time. We have had like an excellent turnout. Uh, I'm really, really happy about, about that. But just like to say, and also going back to Lisa, in terms of what the way forward is, like I said in the start of the webinar, was that this is, we're just starting this, um, uh, research project we have just uh, conceptualized the broader questions that um, uh, we w wanted to ask and our aim of this webinar was exactly what I think has been achieved here is to get a perspective of what the issues are what is happening and then it will help us to shape our research um, our research question so the next step we're going to contact you again with a, a survey with the potential one-on-one um, -on -one, um, interviews and so to really have a crack at some of that data that Lisa is talking about that we want to generate. So we'll come back uh, to you and I'm very uh, appreciative Lisa of your suggestion of setting up an advisory or a reference group. I think that's very important. That's one of the action points that um, uh, we will um, we will take forward, and we will invite you to participate uh, in that um, advisory or reference group, so that we can we can collectively shape um, th this work. Because for me, my coming from an academic background, I always think of myself as a recovering academic. You know, in academia, what we do is we publish very nice papers in high impact journals, but the story often ends there. And that's for me is what actually frustrated me about the life of academia because I always tell people I come from you know the ground where all these experiences of whether it's gender based violence, poverty, and so on is experienced. I absolutely add no value in operating only in the academic space, and so that's why we think of ourselves as a think do tank, and and so we want our research to be really a co designed a collective effort because we think that is the only way that any insights that we gain from this um, project can help inform the way forward. So thank you so much for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to, on that note, end the, uh, the, 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 the webinar. I just have one last request uh, for our social media uh, benefits. If you can just turn in your camera for just one second, one take a group, um, group photo uh if if you can't it's okay but if it would really be good if you could uh, so we can just see who you who, who 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 you are um and i take we take a group photo thank you so much all right let me see how we do this i'll let you um gallery I'm just trying to expand my screen. Yeah, all right, there we go. Hi, Amos, how are you, Amos? Hi, yes. Are you, are you good? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Can, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear clear. Yes, Kevin Muller. I'm, yes. I'm sorry, man. Uh, the thing is, I'm actually look, looking forward to our next session. I was just a bit inundated with the unforeseen uh, obligations because I know this uh, session started at two o'clock. And then uh, just to come and find, like, I did receive the reminder on my device, but then I was inundated. I normally do work on the coal mines and platinum mines. So I look forward to our next encounter. I will actually make sure that I keep my diary open then, and then we can then take it from there. Sorry, sorry for that, but I tell me the recording, the recording of the session, would you be able to send it to me via email, uh, Amos? Yes, 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 the recording will be shared um, via, via, via email. And like I said, we'll follow up with you guys. We have a survey, 
question and so so all will be in touch this is an idea our idea is to build this community of practice that will continue until the end of the of the project so this is one of a series of engagements that we will be convening no oh, that's sweet sweet stuff Amos. i look forward to our future engagements together okay thank you so much uh kevin and everyone else and on that note, I would like to once again, thank you so much for your valuable time. Have a good day until next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Yes, bye. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Mayo. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. bye.